Hi everyone, uh, I'm Will and um, this presentation is about how you can prototype and deploy a uh, iPhone, like a native iPhone app with Fask and JSON kit in from five days to maybe seven if you want to really get fancy. Um, so I work at Whois, uh, building domain name APIs and that kind of thing. Um, so doing availability checks, DNS checks, uh, creating APIs that handle uh, 60 to 80 million requests a day. Um, that's like just a normal day for us. Um, I also build the various mobile and web applications with various domain tools similar to what I said before. Um, as well as CDN integration and uh, image, video and audio asset delivery. So this presentation is uh, targeted at the idea-rich, time-poor developer. So rapid iOS dev on a low budget with open source libs, libs and an open source stack. So really easy stuff. Um, so I'm going to go through the steps on how to build a scalable and simple data-based iOS uh, app with a REST API backend uh, by using open source components like MGBox and SVHTP request and of course the Flask web framework. So what I really like, well, I like building stuff that works and when I say works I mean works well and is easy. Um, I also like using the right tool for the job. So I don't care what language, architecture it uses, it can be in Python, PHP, it doesn't, I don't, I don't care. Um, as long as it doesn't break and it can be knocked together in the allocated time and not go over budget. Um, so for something that requires high concurrency, I'd use Golang. And for something that I just want to really get together in a weekend, for example, I'd use Python and maybe Postgres as a database. Um, so yeah, I'm a strong uh, believer in fast deployment, so um, building a working model quickly and pushing it out as fast as possible without sacrificing usability or security in the process. Um, so I'll talk about that later when I discuss how to actually deploy an app and be able to scale to this 80 million requests a day. Um, so yeah, back to the basics. What is a simple data model view controller really need? Well, it needs some data. I mean, that's obvious. So uh, movies are generally is this. So I'll do a vintage movie streaming app um, with like a little scrollable view and a uh, very small data set, so less than 50 movies. Um, so we won't have to think about sharding or any of those other problems that happen with very high concurrency applications. Uh, so we need an API. So I'll be using the Flask API, uh, Flask uh, Python micro framework, and the basic um, self-contained transactional database called SQLite, which is the database that powers uh, the Firefox browser. So all the conf config and settings are held in, in SQLite database. Um, but this can be easily replaced with um, MongoDB, MySQL, I mean, whatever you really want. But you can figure that out when, you've, when you're building your own thing. Um, and then finally, obviously, is, it is an iOS dev conference. Um, an iOS app to display and sort these movies by genre and rating, basically acting as a as a thin wrapper for our REST API. So I'll be using MGBox2, uh, SVHD request, and JSON kit. And there's the demo URL. Uh, yeah, so that's the actual application. So I should be able to show what it looks like um, if everybody else in the other room doesn't conflict. Because I'm already seeing other ones trying to mirror onto my computer, so uh, I should just be able to show that directly. Okay. Yeah. So this is just a basic example of what you can achieve in a few days just by using open source stuff. So this is like a uh, MG box, which is the grid layout system. And it's automatically using a REST, it's connecting to a REST API and pulling these um, assets down. So if I click on a move, for example, um, probably better. 
and then you can watch that movie from directly in the app so it'll start playing but and you can also um, there's a little menu where you can select the genre and it'll automatically select the movies that match that um, that genre so that's just a very basic example if it's working yeah. okay so just let me turn this off Okay, everybody is <laughs> trying to connect to my phone. Uh, come on. Anyway, okay. Now it's not working at all. There we go, okay. So what does our local environment look like? So on our, you know, on our Mac, as we've all got in the room. Um, so brew. Oh, everybody else has already talked about this. All the other presenters I've heard have mentioned this in some respect. Basically, it's a uh, OSX package manager. Um, you know, for installing things like Vagrant, which is uh, what I'm talking about now. Um, and Vagrant is a little uh, little tool that lets you create these tiny little portable dev environments. So, like a, a Ubuntu LAMP stack, so Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, or a LAMP stack, so you know Linux, Nginx, uh, MySQL, and PHP. But we'll be creating a leg up stack, <laughs> which is a Linux, Nginx, Gunnicorn, and Python um, uh, stack, which I'll discuss later. And then finally, virtualenv, which is on the Python side, and that is essentially the same thing as Vagrant, but for Python. So it creates these little portable environments for uh, Python modules and settings, and it's pretty much a standard in the in Python dev. And then finally, uh, Sentry, which um, can be plugged into any sort of application and provides crash analytics and other types of data um, analytics to do with your application and statistics and stuff. So day one and two, uh, we're building the REST API. So that's Flask. That's how the Flask syntax looks like, but we'll discuss that in a second. Um, so what is REST? Well, it's not standard. Um, everyone has their own take on it, uh, meaning there's lots of really just crap APIs out there. Um, that's pretty much the standard in the industry is bad APIs, uh, especially big corporate people making, trying to make it as bad as possible for everyone, for all us developers. Um, so what are the characteristics? Well, first and foremost, it's stateless, meaning there's no client context. Um, the session is abstracted away from the server, and every response should contain all the information you requested. Uh, shouldn't care about anything on the client side. Uh, it's layered, uh, meaning you can individually scale components on the API depending on load, which is what we do on our stack, um, or take down specific layers of the API for maintenance, but that's that's a, at a higher level, but it's just an important feature. And client server, that sort of comes with being stateless. And it's uniform. So you build a REST API, and you can use it as a back end for your Android app, your web development. Um, goes in with jQuery really easy. I mean, whatever. It's been used for many years. So, uh, so what are the best pack practices that I've found in trying to build something that can scale really well? Um, so separating resources into defined categories, which I like to call nouns. So you've got get slash movies, would give a listing of all the available movies, get slash movies slash suddenly would retrieve an individual instance of a movie, which is called suddenly, for example, or it can be, you know, living dead or whatever movie you want. Um, and then a post request, I haven't got any variables there, but you know, you can add that as a request variable, so, uh, which will create a new rating. So just that very uh, clear cut um, separation between different assets and different categories. Uh, using the established methods, so get, post, delete. You know, there's hundreds of them. There's put and update. And there's all the different ones that all other people have made, but I like to keep to those three, um, as well as sometimes using put. And then for filtering and searching through collections, you've got 
verbs. So um, I like to send a little bit of a JSON request across with a query string like that, which I found is the easiest way to do it, and it doesn't muck with your whole separation of categories. I've seen some people, they do slash, um, so for example, if they wanted to get um, the genre, action genre, they'd go movie slash action. But the problem with an API doing that is then what if you have a movie called action? I mean, it's just obvious. Or if you have a movie called anything that you're searching for, I mean, it, it breaks that. It's, just, it's a thing that I've seen happen before. Um, also, with query strings, you can add as many um, variables you want to that JSON-y query. So why use JSON? Well, you've probably already used it, but it's simple. So it's much simpler than XML or SOAP or whatever horrible other thing you want to use. Uh, it's directly translatable to Python's dict function. So, you know, it's pretty much a standard and you can easily read it. Like, you know, it's all, you all know what's going on there. Uh, yeah, and it's pretty much standard across all sorts of platforms. Uh, so we want to prototype a RESTful API very quickly. So I'm going to use Flask, um, which is a rapid web development framework for Python. Uh, the SQL Alchemy ORM, uh, which is used by Reddit, um, Mozilla, Yelp as a database. And for, as a database, I'll be using uh, SQLite. Um, however, SQL Alchemy can take my SQL Postgres or you know, whatever. Only thing it doesn't really work with is Mongo, which is if you're doing NoSQL stuff, um, that sucks. But they've got a native um, Python connector, so you don't have to worry about using an ORM anyway. Uh, so Flask is simple. I mean, it's pretty obvious what's happening there. You, if you do a get request on Slash, it'll return Flask is simple in that little app there. So it's easy. Um, and you can run that just by going uh, pi, python dot slash app dot, dot pi or whatever. It's very, very easy. Um, so yeah, before you begin actually creating the um, RESTful API, I suggest you know you install virtualenv, env, which is what I was talking about previously, and that there are just some commands which you can, which activate it and then create a new virtual environment, switch over to that source, and then uh, use pip, which is a Python package manager to install Flask, SQL Alchemy, uh, the Flask SQL Alchemy, Alchemy module and Raven, which is the um, the client for Sentry. Uh, so now I've got the model. This is pretty basic stuff. All of this is just setting up some basic fields. So uh, post the image URL, title. I've just put arbitrary um, limitations on size and string type, but yeah, that's very basic. There's no types of um, like that could probably be hacked. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so get slash movies. We want to do a SQL Alchemy um, filter on our on movie record, which was that model we created before. And so this would return all movies descended by rating. Um, yeah, so return every movie that, that's in your database descended by rating. I mean, it's pretty easy. That's that's SQL Alchemy doing all that. Um, stuff for you in the back. Um, so now with a added Flask wrapper code, it would pretty much be that. It's probably a better way of doing it, but that's good enough. <laughs> um, and so another example, so if you want to get the specific movie like I was talking about before, um, similar thing where you uh, do a query dot filter and then the title equals title and it's getting the title from the string there and at the top in the app.route um, string dollar title that's making it so that you can't put any crappy code in there it's CSRF uh, CSRF protected uh, not CSRF um, yeah CSRF protected and some other types of things um, let's say if your title had like if they misspelled it you could also use a Python library which I found called um, which I use all the time called fuzzy wuzzy which is a um, fuzzy matching on strings, so you can do that as well. And so for our query string, um, this is also pretty easy. So it's SQL Alchemy is automatically pulling in those arguments um, from the JSON get request automatically and then 
doing a filter on that. So you can have as many things as you want. You just have to make sure that that JSON string is well formatted. You know, you can also add things like response headers. Um, so, you know, different statuses and links and authentication and caching and all the other things that you can, that you don't need for the ba for the very basic type apps, which I'm talking about. Um, there's also error handling. So, you know, if an object doesn't exist, it'll return this. And you also got to remember when you're using these types of things, if you're rendering JSON, you have to serialize it. Otherwise, iOS won't be able to read what you're giving it, which is a common mistake that people make and they wonder why uh, JSON kit isn't reading and having all these errors with dicks and stuff and because you haven't serialized it. So do that. <laughs> these are two handy little functions which I wrote to do that exact thing. So you don't have to know how they work or whatever, you just have to use them. <laughs> um, so day three and four, building an iOS wrapper. Well, it's a wrapper by any other name. It's an app by this definition. Um, so environment, other people have already talked about this. This is CocoaPods, which is a Ruby gem um, to manage your, all your dependencies in Objective-C projects. It's awesome, uh, really easy to set up. I mean, he said other people have been using them, so I mean, yeah, you can, there's all sorts of different things and you can also connect it directly into GitHub so it can pull repos down and automatically use them as dependencies. So for this, I'm getting these pods here. So the JSON kit, reachability, SVHT request, MG Box 2, um, the grid menu that I showed when I swapped across, uh, the side menu, um, this that alert view when I clicked on the the thing I just made a custom little alert instead of having to create a different model. I just thought I'd just do that instead, and then flat UI kit, which you don't really need, but it makes it look a bit better. Probably not now. That was in iOS six. Um, so yeah, new relic. Also, when you start reaching scale, you need to analyze every single part of your stack. So your server, your um, your application any type of things that you're connecting to and New Relic can visualize all this data for you. Um, so, you know, inserting it in your iOS project is literally three lines in your app delegate. And it'll be very good for fault finding and, you know, seeing where you can optimize bits of your application. Um, so, that's readable, yeah. So this is just the, this is just the basic thing that I've, that I've got in the, in the main um, view controller. So basically what's happening is SV, SVHTP client is a convenience function for uh, JSON kit. Because I know JSON kit's already easy, but this just makes it even easier. So connecting to a REST API is pretty much just setting a base path and then setting your API string. So vint.tv slash movies would um, be where the where the movies come from. It's pretty easy, uh, and it's also setting up MG Box there with the MG Scroll View, and basically MG Box is just a uh, grid layout system that lets you put little boxes of data, little um, you know, set up these little grid items on on the screen. So I set you know where you can put the post where I had the posters. Like each one of those posters was a grid item. Um, so this is a basic. Um, get request on the API. So as you can see what's happening is I'm doing get request on slash movies and it's returning a movie array uh, pretty easy and then for every movie in that movie array it creates a box. So that's it. It's very, very, like that's, that's, that's the only code you need when you're using something like MG Box to render all these little boxes on the screen. It automatically you know, figures out the configuration and that kind of thing. And then for each one of those boxes, it's setting a margin, and the border color. Um, and then inside that box, it's doing another get on the poster image. And then it's setting that image inside the, inside the as a sub view inside the actual um, grid item. And the great thing about MG Box as a prototyping and grid layout system is it's got automatic, it's block based and it's got a 
bunch of convenience functions like on tap. So you know, if you tap it, it'll run what, whatever in that code from wherever is from wherever your code is located. Uh, so for example, on this, um, when I click on one of those posters, it's generating an alert view with the um, title of the movie and the message being the description of the movie. And then it's adding three buttons, the watch button, the rate button, and the back button. And because I've already uh, put MP Movie Player inside, which is just a standard IS library, um, when you click the watch button, it's actually pulling um, the value for the value for key movie URL down from your from your already downloaded um, thing from your dict from your dict, and then it's opening that movie in full screen. So you can instantly start loading a thing, start loading a movie, and watching it. Um, yeah. And then this is just that's that scrolling back and forth the uh, the menu items, which I've just set up as basic, you know, action, um, you know, crime, horror, drama, adventure. But you can you can also do that with um, with with the SVHD request and create a new item for every item in a list. So if you wanted to get a list of all the genres and you wanted that genre list to be customizable, then you just pull that down from the API in the same way that you pull down the movie information. So it's very sim very uh, similar. So you're almost finished. Um, day five is deployment. Now we all know that mobile dev doesn't always rake in the cash, and even if you build something that isn't monetized and you get heaps of users, um, you might end up with a two grand server bill, which happened to me, and it wasn't great. Um, yeah, having to justify that expense. Um, but that's, that usually comes with writing bad PHP. So many people skip this step and they use Heroku for example. Heroku is great, I love it, but as soon as you hit any type of scale it starts really costing. Like uh, Rap Genius for example, well, I haven't got that one there, but Rap Genius is a very good example of this. They didn't integrate monetization very well into their initial model. They became very, very popular in the first few days, and they ended up having a two, I think it was a $30,000 bill, um, and they didn't have any venture capital. So it was just, they were, it was all their, their own funding, and they had to come up with a 30, 30 grand bill, and they hadn't made any money. So, yeah, so be careful. <laughs> um, so I've found it best to do, you know, to roll your own, um, especially for tiny little projects. So a combination of um, ORS or DigitalOcean or whatever VM provider that you want, um, and high performance application delivery solutions like Nginx, uh, Gunicorn, and I've already talked about Vagrant, but that's on the dev side. So Nginx is an asynchronous event-driven uh, reverse proxy system could also serve static files and that kind of thing, but it's mainly used as a reverse proxy for other application uh, delivery servers like uh, Gunicorn, which is specifically for um, Python. Um, and it's based on Ruby's Unicorn project, which is a non-locking um, threaded application delivery system. So I use these things to create my leg up stack, so Linux, Nginx, Gunicorn, and Python. So yeah, so Nginx is used by Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, Airbnb, insert massive apps here. Um, and specifically for that reason, that it's non-blocking, it's asynchronous, it's very well tested, it was made by Russians. Um, that's not really a reason, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, they don't have much money, so I don't know. <laughs> the, the main reason, the dude who actually invented it, Igor, um, Igor Sizev, was specifically this problem. He had no capital, and he had a very popular application. So that was the main reason, the main driver behind Nginx. And Apache is just, yeah, I never use Apache anymore. Um, and Gunicorn, same thing. It's also created by Russians, which is odd, but it is. Um, and why? Because it's easy to configure, and it's production ready. So, yeah, they're pretty much the main reasons. I mean, you can use uh, WSGI and... Um, bottle, but yeah, well, not bottle. Um, but yeah, but WSGI isn't that great either, so don't use that. Um, 
So how do we set up a little mini Vagrant environment to, before we deploy? So we've already got our application working locally, running on our, on our machine on you know, uh, 127.0.0.1. So we pip freeze and that gives us a list of all, of, all, of, all our um, requirements that need to be installed on our Vagrant machine. Um, then we just go Vagrant box add base files.vagrantup.com slash precise32.box and basically that's and then Vagrant in it and Vagrant up and there you go you've got your own Ubuntu machine running locally on your Mac so to test whatever type of high performance Nginx, Gunnicorn, whatever type of setup that you want to run in production you can just test that locally so very easy um, and then you can also and then once you want to actually put it into action so for example on DigitalOcean uh, which is where I host all my stuff. Um, this is actually in Vagrant. You've got a thing called a Vagrant file, very similar to a pod file in CocoaPods. And basically it's telling it to um, set up, uh, to create a connection to DigitalOcean, digital uh, create a new DigitalOcean box, and then upload what you've made locally to that. But the changes are very, very minimal. It's got a... It's got a um, hash base changing algorithm or some kind of thing that makes it so it only ends up uploading like your actual project files so it's very easy um, and very quick to deploy. So yeah so once you've created that Vagrant file in that directory you can um, install the Vagrant DigitalOcean plugin or ORS plugin or whatever plugin you want um, and then SSH into that little Ubuntu box and then it's a very similar process to what was before. You know, you just set up the same environment, you're just duplicating that, that same thing that you've already done. Um, except this time you're installing Nginx and you're installing Gunnicorn. And that's, that's literally the steps there, those, those commands to do this. I mean, there's like 10 commands there. So it's not that hard. Um, and so basically all this is doing is installing Flask, installing SQL Alchemy, installing Gunnicorn and then running Gunnicorn with your uh, old movie database app, which is what's happening there, and then putting it on 127.0.0.1. But because you've got Nginx running, because Nginx is a reverse proxy, it automatically proxies all connections coming in to that, um, to that local port as like, a, as like a middleman. And that's your Nginx settings. So yeah, see, proxy pass, 127.0.0.1.8000, you know, there's all sorts of other things you can add in there once you start getting a lot of users, like um, you know, having mo multiple uh, Gunnicorn machines, so multiple VMs running Gunnicorn as well. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much exactly the same process, and then run Gunnicorn again, and then it works. So... This is also something that a lot of people get wrong in um, when they're developing their, you know, their great uh, content-based apps. Um, so in a standard system, you serve your static content uh, from the same server as the application or on a different server. But this creates like a lot of problems if you reach any, if you get any real load or you know bandwidth issues. So say if you're like Imager. Uh, who have multiples of, they have hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of images um, or hundreds of gigabytes of bandwidth on a single image. Uh, how's your application delivery server like Nginx going to handle that static load as well as also your application API load? So you should really create an abstraction between the two and use something like a, um, a content distribution network, which is already done for you. There's Cloudflare is a great example of that. And basically it just, it's a, um, this worldwide network that has hundreds of different nodes all across the world and then you push out your one, your one image or your one audio file or your one movie and then it will push them all out to those hundred different servers. So say if I'm in Australia and I download a movie from your app, it will download it from Sydney as opposed to downloading it from America where the original file was hosted. Um, and this takes so much load off of your um, application servers, because um, especially with video streaming, because video streaming is very RAM intensive, and usually takes you know 20 megs or even 30 megs for each individual video loading event. So yeah.
CDNs are great. And Cloudflare is free, I think, so that's what I'll be using. Um, so day six and seven, uh, you add your additional categories and models. So, you know, if you want to add TV shows or, you know, old music or whatever, it's, you know, it's open to interpretation. You can do whatever you want. So you create a separate collection in slash TV or slash, you know, audio or whatever. And you can easily do that by um, just changing the base URL that SVHT request uses. So you take that, that boilerplate code that you already have and then just change it from slash movies to slash TV. Um, yeah, to add additional models. Um, yeah, and then sit down, relax, stick it on the App Store, and see what happens. <laughs> Good luck. So the source code is available from GitHub on my GitHub profile, and I've also got the slides up on Speaker Deck for the command for the command line, all that kind of thing. I've also got a uh, video demo of this um, of type of scale that you can handle on a single VM. Um, on my GitHub profile as well. So, 